This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. Police in Edmond, Oklahoma respond to a pre-dawn 911 call. I could see a female standing in the doorway under a porch light. There was blood on her face and she was hysterical. The woman says an intruder killed her boyfriend. He was just a bloody mess. Uh, he had been stamped numerous times. Investigators scramble for suspects. Can a trail of bloody footprints lead detectives to the killer? Agents from the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation and Edmond Police arrive at the crime scene. The house belongs to 27-year-old Gary Larson. The victim was laying in the corner of the dining room. He was in just underwear, and there was uh, two massive stab wounds to his chest and there were 20 to 30 various size stab wounds from there we we waited for the medical examiner's office to examine him a little closer and see the magnitude of the, and the violence that was uh, done to him on the wall above his body there's a blood stain and a large crack. It was almost just an outline of the body where the body had crashed into the wall, into that sheetrock there, and collapsed. It would appear that the victim was walking right through the house, right in the dark, and someone came out of the complete darkness planted a large knife right in his chest that went completely through his body on the first stab and then a second stab all the way through the chest knocking him into the wall there wasn't any kind of struggle that he would have been able to uh, try to defend himself on the floor next to the body is the faint outline of a bloody bare footprint this was the first crime that uh, I had ever been involved with that uh, had a bare foot. The shoe prints, there are a lot of that, but the actual footprint, like a latent footprint, well, I'm not familiar with us ever doing it before, and I don't even know about stories where people have done it before. Criminalist Douglas Perkins suggests luminol testing to see if there are other footprints or blood stains not visible to the naked eye. This was our first opportunity to apply it to a crime scene. The luminol being a way to find occult or hidden blood through a darkened environment and to help follow the pathways and try to ascertain what had happened. Luminol was relatively new at that time period. A lot of people had not even heard of it. We taped up the windows with, with a black bisqueen material, and then we mixed up our chemicals. And at that point, spray onto that first area where I thought I saw the beginnings of a footprint. The results are immediate and dramatic. And lo and behold, there it was, a right bare footprint, and it was twisting, showing that the person hit the floor at that point, turned their foot, and then were heading off in a direction towards the back bedrooms. Following the trail to the master bedroom, investigators find evidence of the sexual assault. 
Things were disheveled in the bedroom. You could tell that, that there was a struggle there. Uh, you know, the sheets on the bed were kind of askew, and we could see some uh, blood stain on the sheets, transfer stains, uh, probably from the perpetrator onto the bed sheets. Next, Perkins sprays more luminol in the hallway. I took the sprayer and I sprayed high towards the ceiling so that the chemical could rain down upon the carpeting that was in that floor. And then you saw three or four more footprints appear in the darkness. It looks like somebody was moving. It made my hair on my back and my neck stand up because I truly was at that point watching the footsteps of the killer. I remember the feeling this is just like Twilight Zone. We're actually following this guy's path that he took. It was like being in the middle of a ghost story. And you could actually follow the crime. You could see footprints down the hallway. And then there was blood on the floor in the bedroom where the assailant had rolled around and struggled on the floor. So it was much like uh, following a ghost through a house on a violent uh, spree. The bloody footprints don't match either Gary or his girlfriend. The bare footprints belong to the killer. There was two crimes committed that night, one in the dining room and a second crime back in that bedroom. And we could then prove that these two were related at, at the same time, since the blood from one led to this other scene. It was in the back bedroom. A section of bathroom tile containing the bloody footprint is removed and bagged as evidence. In a front room, detectives find a cut window screen they believe that's where the killer entered the house. The house was on a corner and it was just right under a street light. So, you know, I'm thinking, this guy's got some nerve to do this right here. That also tells us someone that is more than likely very familiar with the neighborhood and felt within his comfort zone there to take that kind of a chance. Outside the bedroom window, investigators find evidence of the killer's hiding place. A particularly interesting thing to us, there was a small wall that extended out wider than the house, and there were bushes that were higher than the window and the master bedroom, which made for a perfect opportunity for someone to spend a lot of time and not be seen. We found an outline that appeared to be buttocks impressions in the soft dirt, and you could almost make out material type fabric like from underwear or from jeans or something like that in that dirt. Detectives are convinced the motive was sexual. My initial thought was it was a young peeping Tom, uh, a guy that had gone around looking in windows for quite some time and had uh, finally just got to the point where he wanted to touch something instead of just look at it. Gary Dell Larson was an obstacle to get to what he wanted. Detectives canvassed the neighborhood looking for witnesses and possible suspects. Every house, was the doors were knocked, interviewed the people that lived there. Try to find out as much as possible who lived there uh, and as much of the backgrounds as possible. The training and experience kept telling us it had to be somebody that was familiar with the neighborhood and comfortable be there 
to, to have spent as long as he did at the scene. But gosh, you know, we were getting nowhere in the neighborhood. Nobody had seen anything, nobody knew anything. I mean, the, the trail was getting cold very quickly. Investigators review their evidence. Gary Larson was taken by surprise and fatally stabbed 20 to 30 times in the dining room. Detectives believe the killer was a peeping Tom, familiar with the neighborhood, who entered through a window. The killer left size nine and a half bare bloody footprints in the house. The fact that he was barefoot was you had to look at that as a pretty big clue. I mean, that's, it's just so weird. These are the actions of a madman. Who, who walks around barefoot in a murder scene? Uh, we just needed to catch this guy before it happened again. As investigators launch their search for the killer, Gary's girlfriend provides more clues. Was the attack random? Or could it have been personal? While investigators secure the crime scene, Gary Larson's 25-year-old girlfriend is rushed to a hospital where a rape kit is used to collect evidence. Despite her condition, her main concern is for Gary and his family. She was so good to us when she was so hurt. And she was beat up and scraped up. And uh, had like red burns all over her, every joint she had and, and was trying to comfort us. She was really, really very special. She was just crushed. Detectives ask the young woman to describe the attack. The female victim described that her and uh, her boyfriend had gone out and they'd returned back to that house where the male victim lived, and she was just going to spend the night. She told me that uh, even though it was a real warm night, he left the air conditioner off, so the window was open, and they, they spoke a little bit while they were laying in bed together. Then, at about 2 a.m., the couple turns out the lights. She said that they'd probably been in bed approximately 20 or 30 minutes where they heard a sound that she described as a clanking sound. Gary gets out of bed and goes down the hallway to investigate. That's when she heard him scream. She sat up in bed and was calling his name. Gary? She was very panicky. She didn't know what to do exactly. Uncertain, the young woman gets out of bed, walks to the door, and peers down the hall. She saw an individual coming down the hallway that appeared to her that the only thing he had on was a pair of underwear and a pair of gloves. And she's trapped. There's no way out of Gary's house. She turned around, ran. He chased her. He grabbed her when they got back into the master bedroom, and a struggle ensued. No lights on. The windows are up. She's screaming. Nobody hears her. The attacker spends almost three hours raping and torturing his victim. She was ready to die. And he kept threatening her with a knife and telling her he had to kill her. 
And I really think it was her ability to talk to him that kept her alive because she didn't know Gary was dead. She knew he had to be hurt or he'd have been back there. But it was her ability to talk to this crazy, evil man and establish some kind of rapport with him that she was an actual person that I think allowed him to leave her alive. Shortly after 5 a.m., as it begins to get light outside, the attacker ties up Gary's girlfriend, puts a pillowcase over her head, and leaves her in a closet. After she heard the perpetrator leave the house, she got out of the robes, ran down the hallway, found Gary, and that's when she made the phone call to the police department. Gary's girlfriend tells detectives the attacker seemed sexually inexperienced. She related the fact to me that it was almost like he didn't know what to do with her uh, when he had her. Unfortunately, she can only provide a rough physical description of her attacker. She was legally blind without glasses, and none of this took part with her wearing glasses. She felt confident that there was blonde or lightish hair. She knew about what his height was. I think he was 5'9", but the main sticking point was that he was barefoot. Investigators release a composite drawing of their suspect. News of the horrific attack shocks the community. A murder is bad. A murder with no purpose, a murder with no reason, freaks people out. People had no idea, is, is there some random homicidal maniac running around Edmond gonna come in, stab me, rape my girlfriend, rape my wife, kill my kids? Gary's friends and family are stunned by the senseless murder. Gary was my little brother. I was 12 years old when he was born. He was the best thing my parents ever brought home for me. And I loved him forever. He grew up and went to college at Oklahoma University and got his education and became a CPA. And um, we still stayed close. Gary's a great guy. I've known him forever. Um, we lived around the corner from each other, grew up together in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Gary was really outgoing, had a great smile, was really talented, was a musician, was an athlete, was really bright. Everything seemed to go well for him. But at the same time, he was very real and very down to earth. I mean, when you were with him, he was like just one of the guys. At the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations, forensic specialists focus on the bloody footprint collected at the crime scene. Like fingerprints, bare footprints are unique to individuals and can be used for identification. And the fact that it was a bare footprint in blood, or deposited in blood, was extremely rare. I've never experienced that. There's no database of footprints. So at that point, uh, nothing can be done until a suspect, a known suspect, is developed and we have known impressions from that individual's foot to compare it to. Lacking any suspect, investigators run background checks on Gary's personal friends and business relationships. Gary had been married before and he had been divorced, but there was no animosity in that relationship that we could find or anything that would indicate 
that that wasn't going amicably. We looked at some of his financial dealings as far as stock market and some of the stuff that he had been involved in. We looked at all those angles to, to see if there was some type of business dealings or just anything there. And this guy was, he was just an angel. We could not find anything. Like Gary, his girlfriend had no known enemies. We tried to look at every male that uh, possibly came into her life or that she had a conversation with or she knew or she felt like it was uh, possible that they may have a crush on her and just nothing seemed to go in any direction. The police, they were looking all over the place. Nobody had seen anything, nobody knew anything. I mean, the, the trail was getting cold very quickly. Uh, it just one-time crime, it happened, and there wasn't another similar crime to it afterwards. With the investigation stalled, fear in the community starts to spread. It just put terror in all of us. Put terror in me from my children, put terror in my parents. And even more frightening, the fact that the killer may be living nearby. As months go by with no new leads, the Edmond Police Department asks the FBI to develop a psychological profile of the killer. The police didn't have any leads, and that was kind of a big part of the, the paranoia that followed all this. Detectives have only a basic sense of the killer's background. Well, it's either going to be a transient uh, passing through or someone who was in that area uh, for a short period of time, perhaps staying with somebody, uh, someone who had moved away, uh, who had lived there at one time. To develop an accurate profile, FBI experts need to know whether Gary or his girlfriend was the target. Detectives returned to the scene looking for answers. Outside the windows where I believe the, the bad guy was able to see inside to tell what was going on, had possibly knew there was a female victim inside, and there are bushes to where he was able to sit under the window. It could have very well been the time that he got partially undressed before making entry so that he would be uh, prepared. After the bedroom lights go out, the killer waits 20 minutes. Then he enters the house. This is the front entryway to the hallway. There's only two steps and to, uh, to the area until you get to here. There was a bloody footprint right here. There was a lot of blood right inside the entryway and Gary Del Larson was laying right in this corner. It appeared Gary Del Larson got up due to the fact he heard a sound or something of that nature. As he came down the hallway, he met the bad guy coming out of the darkness. Planted a knife right in his chest and then knocked him into this corner stabbed him repeatedly many times. The killer then went after his target. He met the female victim right somewhere in this area or inside the, the uh, bathroom. And then he followed her into the bathroom back towards the bedroom. 
Detectives believe the killer's goal was to sexually assault Gary's girlfriend and that Gary got in the way. As they got into the master bedroom, then uh, the bad guy got a hold of her, got her by the arm, started trying to tie her up. He started trying to suffocate her, and she was struggling to get away during that whole time period. And they spent probably three hours in this room and uh, struggling, him tying her up and various sexual assaults. Knowing the assault was sexual in nature helps the FBI profiler provide a more detailed portrait of the killer. The victim stated the attacker seemed sexually inexperienced, which suggests he is young. They put the assailant to be 20 to 27 years old, probably familiar with the area, possibly lives in the area. They were able to tell us that the killer most probably had been living with family, but had left the area shortly after the killing was done. Probably a first time murder, even a first time crime, possibly a few misdemeanors, smaller type crimes in their past. The FBI profile also suggests the attacker lived nearby, but did not know his victim. This person probably was a peeping Tom for quite a while and um, got fixated on her. Didn't know her, she didn't know him, didn't know Gary, Gary didn't know him, didn't see Gary as a person, only saw Gary as an obstacle to doing what he wanted to do. Evil. Just, you cannot imagine it. Two years after the murder, the investigation remains stalled. Police have physical evidence from the crime scene and an FBI profile of the killer, but still no suspect. This was frustrating to anyone that knew the story. I think we live in a society where we watch a lot of TV and they always tell us the answer to the mystery. So for it to go unanswered, there's a lot of pressure on anyone to answer that question. Authorities try anything they can think of to force the killer out into the open. One of the interesting things was that um, the FBI had actually come to uh, the newspaper and asked them to put out uh, stories profiling the, uh, the killer and saying that they thought he was homosexual and, and putting in details like that, hoping to enrage this guy and get him to show himself. With the investigation at a dead end, detectives re-examined their case. The killer left behind a size nine and a half bloody bear footprint, along with his DNA in the semen recovered from the rape victim but neither are any help without a suspect to match. An FBI profile suggests the killer lived close to the victim, but didn't know her. He may have also left the area shortly after the murder. You take a step forward and then you have to take two steps back. It was just very frustrating there for a long time. It was going to take something miraculous uh, to break this thing open. For years, the case stays cold. Then finally, after almost two decades, a dramatic breakthrough. A new detective connects a new crime to an old crime. Unit responding behind the school. Possibly had someone detaining a peeping Tom. The 
the murder of Gary Larson and the brutal rape of his girlfriend remain unsolved for 18 years. A crime like that to go unsolved for that long is not something that uh, is normal, nor something that we find acceptable. And I'm thinking to myself the whole time, this guy's got to be out there somewhere. Steve Day was Prince Charming in that case. I mean, going around, trying to footprint everybody to see if it fits. Steve Day had told me that even after all this time, he was still looking. No one gets murdered in Edmond and the police give up on it. They weren't ever going to stop. Then, in April 2004, patrol officer James Ham responds to a routine call from dispatch regarding a peeping Tom. Respond to a trouble unknown. To be located behind the school. Not sure exactly what's going on. Someone was asked to call 911. Unit responding, possibly have someone detaining a peeping Tom. It came as a triple unknown call. The uh, person who had called number one said there was a couple people out uh, on the street, and simply one guy was yelling, call the police, call the police, over and over. Officer Ham arrives at the scene and finds a homeowner making a citizen's arrest of a man dressed all in black. The thing that stuck out in my mind is remember seeing this black thing around his neck that he would pull up over his face and that he had cut out the slits for his eyes. The man in black is 38-year-old Jonathan Graham. The officer detains him while the homeowner explains what happened. There had been a couple different instances where his kids either saw somebody outside, somebody looking through the window. He had filled us in about the past and uh, how he'd had a peeping Tom and that he had set up a little security system and that it had went off this evening. goes out the front door to see a man all dressed in black standing beside his house. Hey! So homeowner jumps on the guy, manages to get him down, wrestles around screaming for somebody to call the police, trying to get some attention while he's wrestling this guy down. The peeping Tom, Jonathan Graham, lives nearby. Officers pay a visit to his house. When we knocked on the door, uh, his father answered, and uh, we began speaking to him about what had happened. And uh, we asked if we could come inside and uh, do a search of the residence, in which he agreed to. In the house, the officers find a home computer. They ask for and receive permission to search it. One of the files I came across was uh, what appeared to be photographs that were taken by a digital camera through a screen uh, looking into the bathroom of a residence. I noticed what appeared to be photos of nude people. We then uh, notified detectives uh, about what we had found and we recovered the computer and uh, transported here to the Edmond Police Department where it was booked in the property. It's not against the law to stand on the sidewalk if you can see through somebody's window. When you start, uh, clandestine would be the word. Climbing a ladder, hiding in the bushes, sneaking into backyards, then uh, that becomes against the law. Graham is placed under arrest on a misdemeanor peeping Tom charge. Greg Elwell wrote up news of the arrest for a local paper. It was a little police brief, but nobody really thought anything was going to come of it. The only thing I really know about John Scott Graham then is that he's living in a room in his dad's house. 
It doesn't look like a whole lot's going right for him. And then he gets pulled in on this peeping Tom charge and it's just sort of like, <laughs> it's almost like a capper. The following day, Detective Stephen Day is assigned the case. The officers on the night that they made the arrest, they had the information from the homeowner. He was suspicious that this guy had been trying to take pictures through the window. If you start taking pictures of that, it becomes a more serious crime and a felony. To charge Graham with a felony, police must prove he had taken photographs of the house he was caught peeping into. And I went out to the house and kind of recreate what pictures we might find. We wanted to see what the inside of the house looked like so that if we saw pictures of the house that we would recognize them. As I walked around the side of the house, I looked at the shrubbery and the window, and it was just a mental picture that it just gave me a feeling. I don't know if you would call it a butterfly stomach, adrenaline rush. To the detective, there's something strangely familiar about the house. As soon as I saw that bush in that window, I thought to myself, I actually said out loud, where are we? I knew that we were in the same basic neighborhood as where Gary Larson was killed. In fact, the house is just one block from where Gary Larson was killed. And on the day of the murder, 18 years earlier, Detective Day had been the first patrolman on the scene. When the detective digs back into the Larson case file, he quickly connects the two cases. Steve started kind of looking into the guy's background and found out at the time of the killing, he was real close to the profile. Jonathan Graham was 20 years old at the time of Gary Larson's murder and lived with his parents just a block from the crime scene. Then, soon after the attack, he moved out of town. It all fits the FBI profile. And there's something else. When Day checks the current arrest report, he discovers Graham was barefoot when he was picked up. Uh, was, you've got to be kidding me. Then I reread the report, then I started checking, and the pieces just started going as fast as I could go. Graham had also been arrested in Texas for an alleged peeping Tom incident. A lady had called in, she thought she had a prowler in the neighborhood. The police had stopped Jonathan Graham walking through a neighborhood carrying a camera, which led them to uh, an arrest and going through inventory of his car. They found a large bag containing several pairs of handcuffs, some knives and swords, various types and sizes, flex cuffs, gloves, darker clothing, two large cans of lighter fluid, sex toys, lubricants, condoms, which all added up to what in our business we know to be a sex kit. And with lighter fluid and flammables, possibly a murder sex kit. For investigators, all the pieces of the puzzle are dropping into place. We're pretty confident that maybe we, we finally got the guy. The one thing that really hit Detective Steve Day was that John Scott Graham wasn't wearing any shoes. 
and I don't know what kind of mind you have to have when a clue presents itself 18 years later on what seems like a completely unrelated case. Clearly a guy who had never forgotten about that initial murder even after a lot of Edmund had. Absolutely a red flag. So, you know, we were working on, okay, let's get a footprint from him. But as Detective Day writes the search warrant he needs to get Graham's footprint, he's shocked to learn Jonathan Graham's been released on bail. It's now a desperate race. Investigators need to make their case before Graham skips town again. Get more solved online. After Jonathan Graham is arrested as a peeping Tom, Detective Stephen Day connects him to the unsolved Gary Larson murder investigation. But when Graham is released on bail, detectives need a way to quickly get him back into custody. I got with Detective Hancock. I said, let's tear into that computer, get what we can as fast as we can. Detective Jeff Hancock pours through Graham's computer searching for evidence of criminal behavior. I'm looking for graphics, of course, uh, JPEGs, uh, any video, anything of that nature. I'm looking through the images, and I did find in excess of 250 files of uh, child pornography. The search also yields numerous voyeuristic images downloaded from the internet. They're not actual uh, peeping Tom uh, images are just made to look that way. And he had hundreds of those types of uh, pictures. He definitely was fascinated with uh, voyeurism. We went down with what we had on the arrest warrant on the computer. The information on child pornography, we put together a felony charge. I sent officers to the house. We rearrested Jonathan Graham. This time, Graham is held without bond. Detective Good immediately takes Graham's footprint. I remember looking at that footprint thinking, this is the one we've been looking for right here. Because I had seen that so much even in my sleep that I was real familiar with what characteristics we're looking for. Graham's footprint is sent to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations. Latent print specialist Jim Stokes is surprised by the request. I've been in law enforcement since 1992 and specifically working with latent prints since 95. And this was the first occasion that I had ever had to identify a bare footprint from a major crime scene. I examined the latent print to see if I could isolate an area of specific detail that would stick out to me that I could visually compare to the ink print in the same relative area. And then once I was able to find that area, I was then able to make sure that the detail was in the same relative position to each other. And once I'm able to do that with sufficient detail uh, to render an opinion, ultimately, I was able to say, to make a conclusion, that the latent print that was developed in blood on the linoleum 
and the ink print that I was provided by Detective Good did come from the same source. It's the news investigators have been waiting for. OSBI calls me up and he said, this footprint's a match. And I go, okay, let's be a little more specific. It matches like it could be his foot. It's the same size. No, it's conclusive. And I just, uh, I got a little chill just thinking about it right now. It was almost like the weight of the world being lifted off your shoulder. You tried so hard for so long. And then all of a sudden there, it, it's over with. Uh, I was just, I was elated. Just, I was joyous. I just felt rage. It was all of a sudden for everybody that he had hurt. And I said, just kill him. Just stand him up, stab him 24 times like he did Gary and just kill him. Several days later, DNA tests confirmed the match. I put together an arrest warrant type and I went down, had Jonathan Graham brought into Oklahoma County Jail and I walked in and I said, you're also being arrested and charged with murder. And he just said, mm, like, okay. Of course, if I was innocent, I would have probably gone crazy, but he just, okay. I thought it was incredible. I mean, who would have thought that the night Gary was murdered, that the young, really young patrolman that was on duty that went to the house and got there first would be, 18 years later, a detective who would catch the murderer. In May 2004, after 18 long years, Jonathan Graham is charged with the first degree murder of Gary Larson and the rape of his girlfriend. I remember just uh, looking down at him and, and thinking, uh, you know, took me a while, but we, we got you. News of the arrest is both a shock and a relief for Gary's family and friends. I couldn't breathe. You know, it was like my heart was gonna pound right out of my chest. I just couldn't breathe. I just immediately felt um, relief. He was so certain that, they, that this was the person who had done it that I was just thankful. I was just really relieved that they had, had solved the murder. When I found out that, that it was a guy in the neighborhood, that really struck me as this was the biggest crime of all, is that this was so senseless. Gary had everything going for him, was willing to work for it. And for this guy to so senselessly and needlessly take that away, I mean, that's, that's tragic. As investigators dig deeper into Graham's background, they find even more similarities to the FBI profile. You couldn't have got the profile much closer, to be quite honest. 20 to 27, uh, that range, living in, familiar with the area, that range, pretty much everything to the point that he had later said that he lost a lot of weight and had some problems right after the uh, murder took place. There were many, many consistencies with the psychological profile. As the case proceeds towards trial, Gary Larson's family and the female rape victim urge the district attorney's office to agree to a deal. The prosecutor was very adamant about 
the death penalty as we all were. The one thing that changed that was the female victim did not want to start this up again. And as you can imagine, the death penalty case would go on for years. It brought back horrible grief, not only for Gary and his girlfriend, but for my mom and dad, for Gary's friends. I don't think there's any justice made for Gary. I am very, very glad this person is not on the streets to harm anybody else. And that, that was my main goal, was that he couldn't hurt anybody else. In January 2005, Graham agrees to plead guilty to murder and rape to avoid the death penalty. He is sentenced to life without parole. Graham's not coming out of prison unless his feet's first. As part of the plea agreement, Graham agrees to answer questions about his crimes. I just want to get his whole side of the thing. I want to get the truth. I want to know what was going on in his mind and how he targeted and why he targeted these people. I never thought I would be here. So just explain that whole event, the way your night started. I just went out to uh, peep uh, and uh, went to a different street. I, I usually didn't leave my street and went to that street and it was just opportunistic. I just was wandering around seeing what windows I could look into and that light just happened to be on. And? And I looked in the window and she didn't have any clothes on. She was coming out of the bathroom, I assumed going to bed. And you never saw Gary Larson? Graham says he left and came back later, this time armed with a knife. When you did come back, uh, describe. The lights were off then. And, and uh, that's when I decided that I was going to rape the girl. The house was pretty much open and she was by herself. I went through the one of the front windows and wandered around the house for a while in the dark. And I uh, bumped into Gary coming down the hallway and was surprised. And out of excitement, fear, shock, I don't remember much of the incident other than I pushed him against the one of the walls and until I was told last year, I didn't even know how many times I had stabbed him because it, I was, you know, so surprised. He kind of pretends like uh, I didn't even know how many times he was stabbed till somebody told me, you know, one of those type deals. The murder weapon is never recovered. So what thought went through your head then? Well, I was uh, scared at that point. I didn't know what to do now. The young lady was screaming at this point. And so I went down the hallway to see what that was about and found her in the bathroom. Graham says he then attacked Gary's girlfriend. I, I think I was just trying to knock her unconscious. And then decided that I couldn't do it without hurting her. And so I figured if I could just tie her up what do you think about her actions during that time period? I don't remember too much about it other than she 
did monitor her and I pretty much decided to not, I didn't want to at a certain point. But you did go ahead and rape her. Yes, because that's what I came from initially. What did you like about it? Um, control. Um, doing whatever I wanted to do. Have there been any other sexual assaults that uh, we don't know about? But not everyone believes Graham's story. In my mind, I feel like he continued on down the path he had started with Gary. Because later in his life, when he was caught, he was on the same path. And it doesn't make any sense to me that he would do that one day and come back 18 years later and still be doing the same thing and not have done it in between. So possibly there are other murders out there that are unsolved. As part of the plea deal, prosecutors stipulate that if Graham is linked to any other rapes or murders, the death penalty is back on the table. For investigators, the case of Gary Larson is one they will never forget. It was probably one of the most important cases I had. It was, it was certainly one of the most difficult ones. There was a few things that I, I may have tried differently if I had to do it all over today. But it doesn't matter who catches them, it's just that they get caught. It's hard to put it into perspective. Sometimes you just don't get the note. And the fact that we did, in this case, get to know, you know, that's, that's a good day in our business. <laughs>